Hey, welcome back, everybody. Of course, you know me. My name is Dr. Keith McNally. This is the Question Guy podcast, and I'm not even going to try. This is Eve. Eve, welcome to the show. Please, but before we begin, what is your last name? Because I cannot pronounce it. <laughs> it's Vivoda. Very simple. Eve, I appreciate that. Now, you're from the Ukraine, yes? Yes. Okay. So um, just out of curiosity, what time is it right now in, in your world? Oh. Well, I'm in London at the moment. Oh, okay. So it's um, eight forty. <laughs> okay, that makes me feel a whole lot better because I'm thinking like you're like almost into tomorrow, but you may not be. Um, we're here to talk about your story because we had a conversation offline, and easily it was it was going on two hours, and you could still talk about your experiences. You are full of stories. And I so appreciate that because that's what this is all about. The question, guys, is really about all about stories, people's personal transformation stories. So we're going to tap into what that looks like for you. Where do you want to get started? Well, I think last time the story which was most fascinating for you, it's about my evacuation from Kiev when the war started two years ago. And as we decide to talk about how to not give up in the worst circumstances in your life, I think that's where we can start. Two years ago, February 2022, we're very close to that date, honestly, <laughs> at Sounds the moment good. when we recorded. So, so let's talk about 2022. Now, for those of you who are in the watching and listening audience, this is going to be something. I mean, she has quite a story. So... It started with the war, yes. Yeah. yeah. So just to tell to everybody is that, you know, many times people think that people who get into the war, they often get unprepared. Uh, to not say that I come prepared to war. <laughs> However, I think that when the day started, I was quite prepared. And I was prepared by my life circumstances because, first of all, I did work on a director positions many times, and I have the habit to go through the stress and with, work with stressful situation differently. And I also coach people. And I coach people how to overcome the fears and how to work with the fears in the most terrible circumstances in their life. And as a joke, when I appeared in a bomb shelter at the beginning of the war, there was a tank attack near my house. And many people don't realize that um, I'm from Kiev, uh, that Russians came to Kiev. There was a tank attack. So there were fights uh, on the streets, gunfights and stuff like this. I have shrapnel in my balcony and things like that. So people don't realize how terrible it was. And the West at that moment didn't believe that we will stay more than four days or something like this. So there was no help. People who were trying to flee from Kiev on the cars many times were shot just on the borders of Kiev. And there was a situation where we didn't know, can we actually go out of Kiev for the certain moment? Because there were three days when you could run away on your car. And then, you know, the arm, Russian army come too close and many people who were in the country house and stuff like this actually stuck there. If they didn't have car, if they didn't have options to run away, the situation with Buche and Erpin, which is very close to my house, uh, was really worse, but we didn't know by that time. So it was difficult, difficult circumstances. And as a joke, uh, me sitting in a bomb shelter with my parents, um, we were very, very lucky because uh, obviously we didn't have bomb shelters in Kyiv prepared for the war. Nobody prepared for the situations. And after Soviet Union, uh, most of the basements were given for rentals to different shops. To They were sold many times. So we had very good great bomb shelter. It actually was a shop of the uh, winter equipment for tourism. So I was covered with snowboards and photos on my Facebook were amazing. <laughs> People were literally were laughing over that. And honestly speaking, this is a tip number one in this situation. When you're in a crappy situation in your life, don't take it too serious. Because I was like, okay, a little bit of hot wine because it's bloody cold, it's February, and we are in a basement, and we are all in that, you know, 
sleeping bags and snowboards and everything. Just a little bit of hot wine and we are almost somewhere in Alps. It's almost cool. Maybe some avalanche just go around. I mean, you can imagine. So, and again, if you ever like do any skiing or any kind of things um, in a cheap way, not in resorts, uh, you would probably end up with a crowd of people sleeping together in some crazy situation, like a hostel or something like this in the mountains. So it was all good. I have good imagination. So I was keeping myself in this little bit more excited mode. I was like, okay, that's all fun. That's all good. All good. I'm focusing on that image in my mind. So I was slightly ignoring the reality, I'll be honest. Uh, not fully, because then you get bonkers. So <laughs> you just need to give yourself a little bit of good memories, which can keep you less nervous. Now, I was also not very effective. I told that I, I'm a coach and I was trying to calm people down. And you need to understand what, what bomb shelter is. It's a bunch of people who never saw each other before. They have no idea who this other person. They don't respect you because they don't know you. You didn't build any relationships yet. Uh, so if you try to help people to calm down, unless you are a certified doctor, uh, nobody will listen to you. So it was really ineffective. Uh, a few people, uh, I helped them to calm down and stuff like this, but it was just two people versus like 60 who were there by the, by the moment. And when uh, on a fourth or something day I get back to my apartment, uh, I met my neighbors who happened to be separatists. I didn't know about that before the war, but they revealed themselves because they felt that, you know, the Russian army is close and stuff like this. And I also apparently knew that in their apartment they, they keep the gun. And because I didn't know that they're separatists, I just knock on the door. I ask how they are because they're my neighbors. And then I heard all the stories from them. Uh, it was quite worrisome because before that I was in a very, uh, I was able to keep myself in a happy mode, let's say. But after the discussion, I understood the plans which Russians have for Ukraine. And pretty much I knew what happened in Bucha and Irpin way before it became the public knowledge. Uh, they told that this was a plan for Kiev as well. And also they were talking about bombing, what happened right now when Russians uh, bombing Kharkiv and these huge bombs, which is 1,000 uh, and uh, 1500 uh, kilograms of uh, blast things and I mean that's a terrible thing which is wiping out cities so that was a plan and when I heard about this they also said that uh, I was like okay and who are they going to kill are they going to kill everybody um, I'm probably quite a good actress because uh, knowing somebody have a gun in an apartment I was pretending that I'm absolutely they had no idea what am I doing in life uh, to be honest that was good <laughs> so I was very, very calm, so to say. And I was like, okay, so um, oh, who, who are they going to kill? <laughs> and they're like, um, probably they will kill people who have something dangerous on the phones. I'm like, mm -hmm, okay. And I'm like, uh, remembering all my conversations in English since 20 years, I'm talking all around the world, podcasting, you know, blogging. I'm like, yeah, that doesn't look dangerous at all for people who don't speak English, uh, of course. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I understand in that moment that my phone is particularly dangerous. I'm like, well, and what uh, you recommend to do then? Because you look like an expert. <laughs> what would be your plan? And he was like, oh, I will, I would delete everything in my phone and I would just pretend that I'm like that Dimbo person who is just only in fashion and super stupid and like, they will pass and then they will happily uh, have all the Ukraine and we will live happily ever after under Putin. And I was like, oh, lovely. Uh, so I thought in that moment, um, and I listened to a few more uh, very Nazi, racist-related stories, how uh, Russians usually call everybody with a bad names and any other nations is a not important nations. A lot of stories which these people told me, which were complete nonsense and shocking to hear from people who I thought I know 
<laughs> so it was interesting. And then I managed to get out from there. So it's like, yeah, I have to go. And they're like, where are you? I'm like, I'm in bomb shelter. And they're like, in which house? I'm like, there. <laughs> there. It's, so yeah, on and off somewhere. Uh, so I didn't tell them where I am as well. And I get out. And when I get back, I also have a con had a conversation with one guy who was apparently ex-military. And unfortunately, I heard approximately the similar story from him as an idea what potentially can happen to Kiev from a completely different person who just knew how Russians act because he was ex-military. And I'm like, okay, that happened to be like a, like a, possibility <laughs> mm. and my parents were absolutely sure that nothing will ever happen and the war will end in 10 days and uh, west will save us god will save us or whatsoever so my mood changed dramatically because i don't have car i i never needed a car i live near the metro station so, so i mean so let me interrupt yeah. just quickly yeah what from your perspective right now based on what you've learned from these conversations what uh, is russians what was russia's plan oh uh, kill all ukrainians that is still their plan that's okay. gen genocide genocide of ukrainian nation and so, it was so you learned beginning. that rather early you learned that in 2020 so, I knew it. I mean I knew it from the beginning uh, the thing is how possibility possible it is knowing the plan straightforward so, you know, somebody can claim genocide and do nothing and just blab about that. But then, you know, the military specifications about this and you understand that these people staying just on the border of Kyiv and I'm my apartment is on the ninth floor. I could actually see the Gastomel fires and, uh, you know, when they attack first. So it's quite close. So it was very realistic. And to me, the first reaction was very interesting. I don't have a car, so I didn't have an option to flee on a car. Hmm. I start looking for people who have a car. And apparently those who have car either had all family in cars, literally cars were packed with people and stuff. Hmm. Or they didn't have a petrol because there was a different thing because petrol actually end in Kiev because like people bought all the petrol, uh, petrol go to tanks, petrol go to military, and there was a huge crisis of actual petrol. So uh, gasoline, I guess, in the uh, US. Uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, actually there was no any, there was no fuel in right. any form or shape. Right. Uh, so even if you have car, you potentially wouldn't have ability to run far enough. So you would probably run and get into Russian army. So, and it was dangerous. As I say, they already shoot cars after three days. It was impossible to move. So it was a problem. Uh, Kiev was almost surrounded by these uh, tanks and everything. And the only way to go, I realized, was the railway. And the railway, basically, people just run to the railway and they caught the train just like whatever they didn't have to buy tickets they just get into whatever go somewhere and they move uh -huh. so my parents were not wanting to evacuate and i didn't know if i want to evacuate so i because i'm a coach i created a very interesting document just before all of this war and stuff like this it was completely different document it called how to find the but how to make decision in any difficult circumstances and it was a draft i literally typed the questionnaire to my friend in messenger and i'm like that's amazing idea don't you think look with all these questions i can create amazing pdf for my program and she's like yeah that's amazing it was just about 10 days before the war something like that and sitting in a bomb shelter that was uh, two days when we couldn't uh, walk away because it was a martial art for 48 hours. I was like, oh, I created this document. Let me find it because I don't have the original one. Uh, so I was like, OK, let me go to Messenger. Thank you, Facebook. We have memories of everything. So I got the document, created PDF because I had nothing to do, 48 hours. <laughs> and uh, in this document, I was like, okay, if this document will help me to make the decision, which is probably life-changing, that works. 
if it doesn't, then I'm going to die somewhere, but it's okay. So <laughs> that's a nice choice of <laughs> making coaching decisions. And I'm like, that's exactly how it's supposed to work. Sure. <laughs> you know? So I went through my own document and so very clearly that decision has to be to evacuate. I informed my parents and I told them that they probably have to go with me. It's up to them. They decide not to. Uh, I informed them a few more times um, consistently so that they changed their decision. Uh, obviously, they didn't uh, decide to do that. And they were like, oh, you need to stay and stuff like this. But I explained them a few things. I didn't tell them about the um, military plans. I didn't want to worry them. and But people in the bomb shelters, they ask me what happened to me. They say, like, yesterday you were all sunshine and today you're, like, all doom and gloom. What happened? I'm like, nothing. Nothing at all. <clears throat> like, and I also understood I'm quite a dangerous person then. If somebody will find me with all my English content and stuff like this on my phone, all my branding communication and things like this, uh, well, uh, I have to either delete everything what I built for many, many years for myself as my personal brand and pretend that I am nothing, or I can still fight. And I also a threat. So if somebody will find my phone, maybe my parents will struggle. So I didn't want to put anybody in any stressful situation. So next day, uh, when I make this decision, I took my mom, the martial art, um, uh, um, hour was over, and I moved back to my home to pack my things. As a very delusional person, uh, when I pack my things, a very big, big bag and one small bag with my tech, not really small, very heavy, not very small bag, uh, because tech is usually the most important part in my life, as most of the podcasters and <laughs> all the IT people know that computer is the most important thing. You can go naked, but with your computer. So, yeah. And, yeah, what, what things you need to take. And then I called to taxi. Because for some reasons, I believe that war, not war, taxi is supposed to work. Uh, that was an interesting delusion. <laughs> That's because you said there's no thing. gas. Not Five minutes ago, you said there was no gas. It's a war. Tanks on the streets. <laughs> what taxi are you talking about? Gas, no gas. There is no taxis. It's a war. Yeah. And that was pretty much the first time when I really understood that it's a war. It was probably it, fifth day of a war. So it, it, it's the an, aha that hit you now, that this is real. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is like how our brain works, you know, it doesn't really reveal everything straightforward. So you can be delusional for quite a long time. Yeah. And so I think who, that one of our war? teams. Yeah. Who's in a war in the 21st century? Yeah. See, the thing is, um, it was very clear that Russia would attack. Uh, we knew about this from news. We understood it. But honestly speaking, it. It was so unnecessary and this kind of cruelty which Russians show to our nations trying to kill off all of us for the fact that we are Ukrainians, it's unspoken nonsense. So mm -hmm. it was something which was difficult for me to comprehend even three to four months after this all situation happened. So it was just, you know, something incomprehensible. For many people. That's why many, many months people in Ukraine did try to write to Russians and they were asked them to stop the war because they believed that they will be heard. But obviously Russians will never hurt us. It's obvious. But people believed that it's all Putin. It's not all Russians. That's not true. There's Russians. So not all of them. So probably some 10 or 15 or 20 percent of normal people. But you need to understand that Russians are hung at 50 million people. And many of them are propagated uh, against humanity quite heavily. Mm. So and they lie consistently that they are victims. So that's another story. Anyways, so for that specific moment, uh, I realized that we are at war. And the situation can happen longer than 10 days because taxis are not working. I mean, I, I wasn't out, so I didn't know the cafes are not working and other things are not working by that time. That would be another shock, right? So 
and I understood that I have to walk. Luckily, uh, we had a station, which our station was as a bomb shelter, so it, it didn't work at the metro station. And uh, I mentioned before that I live very close to metro station. And I had to go to a bigger station, which is like maybe 15 to 20 minutes walk from my house, which is fine. But then in this specific moment, I'm old woman. I can't walk with really heavy bags and then jump on a train, which our trains actually above the platform. So you have to conquer two or three steps, you know, and, you know, use that kind of hangles. So if you have very heavy back, you'll just simply fall off considerably. People will take you away from the train. So, uh, and that's that moment when my Sherlock Holmes, uh, if you ever watch uh, the movie by Guy Ritchie started, you know, that, that that's moment like, okay, I will hit this guy, in, you know, and that's what will happen two years of recovery. That start working in my head. So something switch on and I'm like, all right, if then I I, I probably I'm, I, I did study programming a long time ago. So this is if the if this and that. So if I don't have taxi, I'm walking and then I pack smaller bag, like really few things and all my tech remain the same, as I say. <laughs> so tech bag and um, beautiful shoes and lingerie. Um, so that's it. And I get uh, to the metro station. The next thing I saw, I say goodbye to my mom, uh, who was like, maybe you will stay. And it is so dangerous, she said, to walk away. I'm like, mom, you have tanks around you. Yesterday, 26 uh, people from uh, Russian intelligence were running around our house and they were killed because they did try to kill us, but they didn't kill us. We have shrapnel on our balcony. If I go west, I'm in less danger. It's like logical, mom. You can still go with me. Would you like to? And she's like, no, I will stay. I'm like, awesome. Then you can't cry. You'll, you know, stay strong. Stuff like that. Mm. And she went back to, uh, to my father and I walk away alone. And it was really, really difficult feeling because this is a place where I was born so I grew up there like for many many years let's say for 20 first years in I mean my house and my parents house are very close I know my school around and things, things like that uh seeing that this area you know the tanks which were burned under the bridge you know the, the this uh, construction against the tank and all the pre-military situation or houses shot and burn around it was really really difficult because it was feeling as if my country was raped by these people I cannot call them people honestly speaking it was really unnecessary violent uh, terrible people who just attack the country for nothing just to kill other Ukrainians so I cannot say I was afraid I think it was a lot of grief and sadness for that what was done to my country. And in this feeling, I had to walk for 20 minutes observing this kind of situation. The interesting part which I saw, because I was in a very observant state, and I think this is something which I can recommend to people, like, you know, when you have that observant state you are not really involved in the situation 100 percent it allow you to stay a little bit more calm uh, to withdraw yourself from any emotional response so I was more like an author of the book walking on the streets heavily impacted by the tanks attack the cars were broken uh, people were you know there were not many people actually because there were crowds and crowds of people who were trying to flee from Kiev in the first days so it was empty area uh people no longer wearing masks you know when everybody got to their bomb shelters we're like what happened to covid you're supposed to die already in this fourth day or but oh no it didn't okay we're going to die after out of the war fine no problem <laughs> so we're like i mean it's really there was no covid i mean there probably was some covid i don't know uh but we all live together since that moment so people were without masks obviously on the streets and then I get to the middle part between my house and that station where I was heading, and uh, I was almost shot. Uh, first of all, there was a guy 
uh, in front of me who shout on someone down there or who was in a car and I couldn't understand at first what happening that guy ran away from that car and when he passed me his face was almost like he was not a human it was some kind of orc face you know some kind of terrible mask of something and I was like oh a strange person I never saw anything like that and then I realized this guy was murderer he was murderer in the car he was trying to steal something and that's why that other guy shout at him and scare him away and I was like oh and he didn't look like a average person from Kiev per se I cannot say he was foreigner but he was something strange and it was weird and then I moved like maybe 10 meters or something and there was a guy who was with a huge gun who shouted at everybody like stop bye bye stuff like that and I was like, oh, okay. So there is kind kind of they stopped people to check the documents or something. And it didn't look like it was pretty well organized. And I was like, okay, so he's going to kill me here. Okay, fine. So I took my passport and I was like, you know, going with my passport. I'm like, I'm just walking here. It's okay. Uh, and I bypass him for whatever reason he was slightly bonkers I think but with gun so then I get to the metro station there were actual real guys who were checking documents to the station because they needed to make sure that there would be no problems uh and I get there and there was some woman who like almost hold my hand and she's like oh are you going here and there and she was like from some movie again because I was an observant stage I didn't make connection with her. And I'm like, I'm going there. The, every 40 minutes, there will be a train. Don't worry. And I deliberately withdraw myself from her because in my mind, I had a very clear message. I have to go this pass alone. And I was like, okay, I like this message. I'm going to stick to it. I'm going alone. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and I was staying there. So this is a moment when I felt completely crazy. Uh, luckily, I learned many crazy mental and metaphysical things before. So I knew how to take myself as a person away from this story and keep myself in this observant mode as long as it possible. And it's not emotional state. So it allow you to not really get crazy like that guy with a gun. So many people who were very emotional and it's a very dangerous to get into emotional state of mind and especially um, the victim state uh, or especially negative state when you hate people because in a moment you hate people, it allow other emotions to get in. So first you hate, then you're grieved, then you're sad and it's it feels like a wave. I couldn't listen to Ukrainian songs for a year because it put me in this emotional state very, very quickly. So you need to know how and when you can allow emotions to work with you. And it doesn't mean that you will be always grateful and be like, you know, oh my God, let's make peace or whatever. No, we're not supposed to make peace with non-humans. But keep yourself in a peaceful state. Yes, it's your obligation to yourself literally in this case you have a question i know no but that's a very interesting statement that there's a way to manage in very stressful and traumatic situations your emotions and you have a mastery over that but that's just a tangent of the story so i want you to go on that could be an entirely yeah. different conversation <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's why i'm trying to focus on the methods so not make it this story just a story right You're make it great. a little bit more effective so when i got to the railway i also knew that there were many people who stayed on a railway station for a few days and they slept there as it is because they couldn't catch a train and that is a thing when you start manifesting my dear friends <laughs> so let me preach a little bit uh, because I've been teaching manifesting for the longest time possible and manifesting just to make it clear for many people. It's not when you say, I want the things to fall on my head and it falls. 
No, it doesn't. Uh, it's when you have a very clear goal in your mind. You clearly know what you want. You are not attached to the way how it's going to come to you. You are calm in your mind. You see you in the end results and you move forward and you allow universe to deliver it to you. Um, interesting state of mind have to be achieved in a state of flow when you are clearly not attached to anything. Very difficult considering it's a war, people are running around, they're all in panic. Um, and it's very easy to get into the state when you in the crowd of people who, let's say, very much affected by the situation. And yes, there were people who slept on the floor, um, even in a metro. So obviously people were trying to protect themselves from any kind of bombing. Uh, by the way, Russians bombed areas around the railway very, very often, even now. So it's one of the most dangerous places in Kyiv, to be honest. So um, I get there and I'm like, okay, I'm going to catch a train. That doesn't make I'm any just... sense. Uh, they usually bomb. Yeah. Logistically, it's a war. So the first thing you're going to take out is mass transportation. Yeah, transportation, logistics, everything. So, yeah. Uh, so the, basically, it was a dangerous place to be. Let's say it shouldn't. It shouldn't have been. That's the whole point. So, whatever reason that it actually still existed and trains were still running, is a godsend because it's a war. Yeah, and Russians actually have the worst army in the world and very low technical knowledge, and this is why we are still where we are. And most of the military were built by Ukrainians in the yeah. Soviet Union. All the engineers and IT people were always in Ukraine. I Not something. <laughs> and that the truth. Okay. <laughs> which which I, Western people don't know. <laughs> I appreciate that. It's like I said, I just learned something new. Uh yeah. All the fleet was built in Nikolaev, all the things, uh it's Yuzhmash in uh Dnipropetrovsk, Zaporizhia, uh, most of the airplane uh factories are in Kiev. Um they don't have anything, no technology at all. They don't have technical technological knowledge. Whatever they mention as uh, most unique rockets, etc., uh, they're not even functional hmm. because they're idiots. So, I mean, they are a very strong army, and there are many, many people who can go as a meet on this kind of thing. And when you need to understand, when you have hungered people who don't know how to shoot, and one great sniper, the hungered people have more chances to kill one sniper who is really, really great just because of the quantity of people. So let's not underestimate the danger of it. So they can be completely incompetent and uh, absolute idiots, which not all of them. There, there's a good part of that army, big part of the army, which is really strong. Uh, but overall, they're not the best. So if you will take the massive amount of them, they are not very well educated people. And uh, unfortunately, when people are driven by emotions and desire to to eliminate another nation for no reason, you can imagine the intellectual level of these people. Do you want to eliminate some other nations for the sake of nations? Did it ever come in your mind? No. no. <laughs> so no. That's a Surprising real question. In the, neither in mine. <laughs> neither in mine. And normal people don't think like that. So right. if you think that it's okay to kill other people because they are of different nation, you are born curse. Hmm. I think so. I mean, it's weird desire, right? I just... There is no reason to kill people because they are of different nation or speak different language. That's weird. Agreed. Uh, anyway, so you're so at the station... It's, it's, there's yeah. this woman so, who's trying to hold on to you. A uh, woman is already, uh, there are plenty of people. You need to understand that when I'm in normal state and I'm traveling around the world, and I've been well-traveled since I was nine years old, uh, all around the world. Uh, I did work 10 years in India before. Uh, so, yeah, people usually come to me in different cities and they start asking me questions. And I not necessarily know the language many times, but something in my face gives them an idea that I know the answer. And they keep going. <laughs> it's like many times it's really difficult to tell people. I mean, I don't even speak your language. A way is there. Most likely it's the right direction, I think. <laughs> so anyways, I get to the station and 
I get to the first, uh, the first train which was there uh, was basically going to the place where I had a special address. My friend gave me the address of her own house in the Western Ukraine. And I'm like, oh, that's a nice sign. Uh, and I get there and people already were thrown from there. Like, you know, that they, we can take your children, we can uh, bring them to Western Ukraine, but sorry, no man, no women, no anybody. So yeah, we packed, we full. The train was already like going and I start asking people because I'm a great networker. So in a very short period of time, like five minutes, I knew everybody. I was like, okay, do I need tickets? Do I need this and that? I got all the information which I needed and people start gathering around and I'm like, no, I'm going to go along. But then a little bit of emotion got to me. It was a small emotion because a woman who had most conversation with me, I pity her. She was... Uh, uh, specifically quite obese and it's important element so it's not to offend anybody it's very important uh, so and I ask you to remember this because it's important for the story so she was big uh, and she had uh, low or raised genes uh, this is also important for the story and not for fun it's important and she had like 20 different packages in her hands and a bag and something else and a summer kind of um, running shoes and quite a short jacket. Obviously, none of us was prepared for the war, but some people like myself were in army shoes and, you know, with a lot of belts and, you know, scotch tape wrapped around all my things. And I did write blog posts about this on Facebook. And luckily, many people did say thank you, because thanks to you, we were able to evacuate, dress well, evacuate children. Thank you very much for all these tips. I told you I was particularly prepared for hiking and <laughs> other things, obviously not for war. Uh, I had experience in different things. So I was prepared to hike, to climb, to fight in case I need this kind of things. And this lady was not. And I felt for her that was that is wrong. Until you save yourself, this is a story which you always need to remember in stressful situation. When the mask fall, put it on yourself first. Until you save, sorry for your children. Uh, so mask goes for them second. Airplanes, planes, people, they know something. And I forgot about that for a second. Here's what, in panic mode, people can kill other people especially those who they just don't know. So they really don't care about anybody. When they're in a panic mode, they're like zebras. They run around, they have reflection, like, you know, with a leg, they can kill you with a leg or something like this, and they will not even remember about this. So imagine this, you have whole railway, people on a different level of the panic mode. It's a war, they are stressed, they don't know how to react. I'm talking to this lady, she just didn't get to the train. And I'm like, yeah, maybe we need to go to the next train because by this moment, the next train is coming. We need to run up for the stairs and then cross the bridge and go down. And she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. She almost threw me from the stairs in this moment in the panic mode and starts running in front of me. And I'm like, how the lady of these sizes can run much faster than me? I mean, I wish I could run that fast. I mean, she's amazing. I'm excited, I'm shocked, I'm abandoned. I feel a lot of feelings in that specific moment. And I'm trying to follow her because we just had a discussion that we're going to move together, whatever. And so I'm moving after her with all my little bags and all my army shoes. And she's in her running shoes and this size running super fast. And for whatever reason, in the end of the stairs, she put her bags down just right on the top of the stairs. You understand I'm running after her. And she then, you know, banged down trying to find something in her bags. And now you need to understand what I told her. She's particularly obese and she has low raised genes. And I'm running after her and all I see in front of me is a huge, huge, huge peach. Let's call it like that. We will speak by emojis by this moment. And when I saw it, I start laughing. Because I was like, that's an epitome of my life right now. This is just a me me metaphor of that, how my life is. And I was like, whoa, I'm not going to bond with people. 
<laughs> I gently overcome her and I get to my stairs. And, you know, this is important thing. Don't take yourself seriously. This is very important. So try to laugh. The more stressful situations, the more you laugh, the better. Don't care if people will think you're crazy. It's okay. It doesn't matter what people think at all in that moment. You need to survive. So I get to the next stairs and on the ne next stairs they say, this is a train key for Rahif. And I'm like, I have no idea where Rahif is. I hope it is on Western Ukraine because if it is in Eastern Ukraine, that would be really sad. <clears throat> and <laughs> I wish I would learn geography. But <laughs> I have no idea where I'm going. And I'm like, okay. So, and in my mind, I start getting the Sherlock Holmes moment. Like, you know, I'm bypassing the first wagon and for some reasons, like not this. And then the next one in my mind is like, not this. I'm like, okay. Like if somebody talking to me, I'm very happy. I'm getting legitimately bonkers. It's awesome. But again, it's like, you know, I'm I'm already not reacting what's going on in my head. I, I sorely believe it's actually true. And I'm getting to the third wagon and I see 60 Indian students trying to get into this train and they are doing the uh, very nice Indian things because I think they have that aunt house mentality when they're in a panic mode. So they act like a collective brain or like, you know, maybe bees. So they can attack a wasp and eat it. But then, you know, like they will get it into the wasp uh, or into the uh, aunt house. So I have to be a good wasp who they can get to the ant house, which is a wagon. I'm like, okay, if they will kill me, at least I need to die inside. And then while I'm looking at all of this, and in seconds, obviously, it's not like I'm staying there and like, you know, having the conversations with myself. It's just really, really far thinking. And in this moment when I'm like, you know, observing all of this, just standing there, like weirdly, uh, they throw like a marine guy, two meters tall guy with a huge bag, uh, this little Indian students, and they're really not that big physically. Uh, they just throw in the guy who is two meters tall with a huge bag. And he's like, I have tickets. <laughs> I have tickets. And they're like, and he's like flying three times. And I'm like, apparently I'm an old woman. I'm not that strong. Uh, if they can throw him, I'll. I have no chance. I'm like, okay, that's a wrong thought. And I, in my mind, clearly, I have a very, very perfect plan. That's exactly Sherlock Holmes moments. I'm like, I need to create a cognitive dissonance. If I will start speaking Hindi to them, they don't expect it from me. And then I will have enough time if I will hang on these rails to get inside. So I will need to have just three seconds effort to get in. And then when I will be in the middle, I just need to catch that kind of handle in the middle of the wagon and then nobody will take me away. I'm like, that's a plan. Okay. <laughs> and you can imagine like... Uh, and I will have only one chance, of course, uh, which is lovely. Uh, but in this moment, you're not supposed to really rely on your logic or your mind because this is absurd situation. So the more absurd you are, the more you really don't care and you look as if it's really crazy comedy or whatever kind of film, uh, you just observe it. You just watch it. And I get there and I slow. I think I was like a little bit of border collie in that moment. I didn't know many border collies. Now I know a few. And I know, you know, border collies, they, when they get on the field closely to the sheep, they hypnotize them and they sit like this for a while. And they look on the sheep and sheep are like, oh, we need to go home. And border collie is like, and she does nothing. She's just sitting there like, you know. And I was border collie in that moment. I didn't know it. So I get closer and they throw this guy and I think I slowly get him closer and closer and closer. And then I, when I cl get close enough so that I can quickly move towards that handle, I get there. And interestingly, because I was really so excited about the process, I quite I hang quite a while on this candle, like, you know, just observing situation like, oh, my God, I could go that far. Wow. So much so that the guy who was throwing this guy before, he's like, tried to push me away. 
but I think based on my energy, he start feeling that something is going on now. In that specific moment, I start speaking to him in Hindi in a way how managers speak to people who are not good workers. I don't speak Hindi, to be honest. I worked in India for 10 years, but I know how Hindi managers, Hindu managers would speak to their workers. And they will say like, don't, they're like, are ya burhi nahi hai? ya? And like, stupid or what? Get away. And like, that's, that's an intonation. So I knew like, Budhi nahi, it's like, you don't have any brains. And like, okay. So I accuse him in a bad working motives, I guess, in a way. I didn't say anything bad particularly because that would uh, make a reaction to push me away. And I was just like, uh, a, you know, wrong type of leadership person who is like, you know, Karen type, Indian type of Karen, I think. <laughs> so in that specific moment, he did this and I did my fast run. Uh, I think if I would run with a rugby ball, I would win something. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> I I got in the middle of that uh, place. And in that specific moment, Maureen uh, was thrown from his coupe because, again, there were 15 people inside and whatever, he had tickets, but he didn't have a chance. So he was also sitting in the middle and I literally stuck near him and like, you know, did that kind of handle thing. And I sit like this until the train moved. The only thing which I did, I turned my head back because I literally felt few pairs of eyes on my back. Like, you know, when somebody stares at you. And I look back and there were two absolutely scared Indian girls who look at me like, oh, ma'am, Hindi speak, speak in Hindi. I'm like, no, <laughs> I don't actually. <laughs> but don't worry, everything will be fine. You know, it was nice, I think. And when the train moved, I start feeling that, okay, I get in somewhere. So that was my first step. Your questions? <laughs> I, I don't, because you are the best storyteller I've ever had on the show. <laughs> there's, no re- there's no reason for a question. You just go right <laughs> on and you've got, you've got it all. I mean, the, and... You and you even could tell a metaphor and a story, and you could stare like a like a, like a like a what 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 kind of dog was that? <laughs> the sheep, border collie, border collie, border collie. Yeah. Oh my gosh! <laughs> you should be on. Yeah. Oh, never mind. You're you're gonna be on the stage eventually because you just tell a story like nobody else. Thank you. Well. So the next that thing, was intermission like, for those who are watching. We got another whole <laughs> hour to go. So this is a long yeah. 